et match. Perfect. Um, so my name is Ivana. I am a young researcher and a PhD candidate at the School of Economics and Business, University of Ljubljana. And I'm here to present a research I'm currently conducting uh, under the guidance and mentorship of my senior colleagues, Professors Andrea Zirman, Nevenka Hrvatin, and Jelena Zoric, uh, who is also my PhD supervisor. Uh, the research is entitled The Role of Social Capital and Housing-Related Lifestyle in Fostering Energy-Efficient Retrofits uh, in Slovenia. It doesn't appear like I can move the slides. Okay. Um, so briefly, just to say a couple of words of um, motivation, why we chose to deal with the topic in the first place, although I think this audience is, is well uh, aware of, of, of these facts. So namely, just in 2018, household energy consumption accounted for more than a quarter of final energy consumption in the EU. This represents that this is a topic that definitely merits um, attention. And amongst uh, different components of household energy, um, consumption. The most dominant one, um, namely 64% of um, energy consumed by households in the EU, went for space heating or space um, cooling. Uh, so we talk about energy efficiency a lot. However, uh, in a household setting, a way to reduce uh, the amount of energy consumed for space heating and cooling is namely to uh, undergo retrofits um, in such a way that you reduce the energy consumption um, and improve the household's energy efficiency. Um, now the GRC technical report on achieving the cost-effective energy transformation of Europe's building stock uh, shows quite worryingly so that almost 75% of um, you, the building stock in the European Union is energy inefficient according to to current building standards and a very small portion of the building stock is being retrofitted each year. Now, um, it is not doesn't come as a surprise that a lot of studies have showed that there is room for cost efficient household energy savings. We all know that this potential that, that this room that exists um, remains still largely unrealized. Uh, there is a large body of literature that addresses the energy efficiency gap that shows what are the certain barriers and drivers to energy efficiency. And in a more narrow sense of the word, um, a lot of studies that examine different factors that influence energy efficient um, retrofits. Um, here, I would like to circle back to the very, um, I'd say, inspiring and uh, very motivating lecture of uh, Ms. Laura Kotzi yesterday, who highlighted that in order to meet the 2050 um, carbon net zero targets, uh, we would need to retrofit one in five buildings uh, in, in the world. Um, essentially, this means the technology is there, the manpower is there, so what is hindering um, this progress? And we would want to join this discussion to um, extend the existing studies and research by proposing two relatively novel um, concepts um, and introduce them in the energy economics literature in a more operationalized type of way. The first one is that of social capital and the second is of housing related lifestyle. So we would want to primarily explore their, the role that they play um, in fostering energy efficient retrofits. Now, just to be on the same page, when I say social capital, what I really mean are all of the features of any type of social organization or community, um, such as trust, norms, even the formal organization uh, that binds that um, community together. So the reasoning is pretty straightforward. Uh, such communities that exhibit um, uh, strong attachments that exhibit um, strong formal organization uh, would also be those who would uh, facilitate and coordinate their actions easier and therefore be more uh, prone uh, to energy efficient retrofits. The second concept is one of the housing related lifestyle and um, lifestyle research is uh, mostly used in fields such, such as sociology with domain uh, specific lifestyle also used for instance in marketing research. Uh, this um, uh, means and by this it is implied the set of different practices that individuals embrace 
not necessarily with the um, aim um, of fulfilling their utilitarian um, values and utili not for the utilitarian function, but because it um, gives form and brings to life a certain narrative or a certain self-identity, allows the individuals to express themselves themselves um, in a more, um, I'd say, layman uh, terms. Now, our research question is, what is the role of social capital in making decisions to undergo an energy efficient retrofits? And what is the role of housing related lifestyle in fostering energy efficient retrofits? And in doing so, we have collected primary da data from a household survey conducted in August 2020 in Slovenia as a part of the EU-funded Care for Climate project. So our initial sample included 3,000 respondents on Slo uh, from Slovenia, and we focused on economic decision makers in their household, because they are mostly the ones who would have the most dominant say in whether a, a household is going to undergo an energy efficient retrofit or not. The survey was conducted online with the help of a market research agency in order to guarantee the representativeness of the, sam of the sample. And we can confirm that the characteristics in the sample closely resemble the population with respect to region, gender, and age. However, we do have a slight overrepresentation of individuals with higher levels of education, which uh, maybe isn't surprising due to the online setting of the, um, the online setting of the survey. Um, now to move on to the method, we employed the random utility uh, theory and the method of revealed preference. Uh, namely, according to the random utility theory, we can um, divide, divide uh, the utility, we can explain it by a known and an unknown uh, component. And um, we can also assess the probability that a certain individual will opt for an energy efficient retrofit and model it through their utility, meaning the individual will choose to perform the retrofit if this choice, if the choice of the retrofit will increase their underlying uh, utility. Um, now in the modeling, the dependent variable has a value of one in the case that the respondent has um, replied that they have performed an energy efficient retrofit in their dwelling in the past. Here we counted um, window wall replacements, uh, facade retrofits, roof retrofits, heating system replacements, and installation of a ventilation system with recuperation. The variable has a value of zero otherwise in case that they didn't perform. It. Uh, the, then we have employed different discrete choice methods to estimate the specified model. Um, so a quick overview of the dependent variable, as I said, so it's a, it's a binomial uh, type of case uh, where if an energy efficient retrofit has been performed, the dependent vari ha variable has a value no, and if it has been performed, it has the value yes, and about 48% of the people have performed an energy efficient retrofit in the past, while 52% have not. Uh, we can see also that like the most popular type of retrofit would be window replacement, uh, the least being the installation of a ventilation system with recuperation. This is in line with other studies uh, that have researched energy efficient retrofits in Slovenia in the past, so it doesn't come as a surprise. Um, now moving on to um, different variables, um, the, the different variables that we've used to explain energy efficient retrofits, just a quick overview of them. Uh, we have divided them into individual and household characteristics as well as the dwelling and location characteristics. Here you will find a lot of the usual suspects from the uh, energy efficiency retrofit literature, such as the gender, education level of respondents, their age, their monthly income, which we have divided into several categories. Um, a, a dummy representing whether they have taken out a loan to purchase their property or not, a dummy representing whether they were the first owner of the property in question, um, also accommodating the fact which households have, um, have children in them as, as household members. Moving on to the dwelling and location characteristics, primarily this is how, how old the building is in years, what type of a housing is it, including um, dummy to account for the multi-dwelling housings, um, number of rooms, that is the spaciousness of the, of, of the housing, 
um, accounting also for regional characteristics, including a dummy for the capital city region and the region with the highest average temperature in the country, um, as well as um, the, the variable corresponding to the noise level in the neighborhood. Uh, so just as from the first glance, you can see that uh, the building stock is actually quite old, the, being the mean um, of the, the, the mean of the how old the buildings are, are is actually 42 years. Uh, so this really falls in line uh, with, the, uh, with the information that I gave before. Um, then just moving on to other two sets of uh, variables, which are the variables pertaining to social capital, such as the attachment uh, to the neighborhood, how attached does a um, person, um, if a person feels attached to their community or not. Um, a dummy representing um, a very ease the representing the ease of agreement within the residential building so um if um if the um, residents are easy to agree on a certain issue uh then this dummy has a value of one um a variable corresponding to how well the respondents know their neighbors whether they find the presence of a building manager helpful here uh, this is related to the formal um organization of the building whether a reserve fund exists in the building as well as importance attached to a free of charge public energy counseling uh, in the local community. Uh, moving on to housing related lifestyle, we wanted to account for the amount of time spent at home and um, included the dummy for a small amount of time spent at home. Um, I believe also a home office situation is something that's very familiar to, to a lot of us in the recent years. So we thought this is also something that could, um, that uh, explains um, housing related lifestyle of a, of a certain person and then the variables that you see marked in the beginning with PC are the principal components um, that are related to different dimensions and different aspects of housing related lifestyle which I will explain in the next slide so the way that we operationalized the housing related lifestyle variables is the following we have asked a large number of questions um, between, I believe, 30 and 40 that pertained to different aspects um, of a res respondent's housing related lifestyle. Then uh, we performed the principal component analysis with Merrimax rotation uh, to operationalize it and to simply reduce the, the multidimensionality of the, um, of the variables. Um, employing the Kaiser criterion gave us seven principal components, which we could explain uh, by the way that the different um, questions were grouped as the first component uh, corresponds to privacy um, and um, how much the, the respondent values the privacy of, of their home. The second to the DIY identity, whether respondent is very hands on with the um, maintenance work and also with the retrofit work done to their home. The third corresponds to energy saving behavior and environmental uh, friendly behavior in general. The fourth to functionality and quality um of this could be either of of objects in their home as well as the the home itself the five to the family life how included is the family in making any sorts of decisions in the family um the, se the sixth to the social life and the seven to how much the uh, respondent values spaciousness of their home um, all of the diagnostic tests uh, seem to indicate that this is the right way to go when it comes to operationalization of the data here i am showing the results of the binomial logic model and as you can see all of the um, characteristics all of the variables that have been shown um, as significant in uh, similar studies have also shown significance here and the coefficients are um, as to be expected um, so we see that higher levels of education would increase the probability of, of retrofit which is um, to be uh, to be expected we can see that higher income categories also increase the said probability what is maybe interesting is that we had this group um, of people who chose not to report their income however uh, when we looked at their education level when we looked at the spaciousness of their homes uh, we could deduce that they probably belong to one of these higher income income groups and it's um it's also interesting that uh they have like that they have a positive coefficient there um 
so from uh, from some of the results that we found unexpected uh, would would for instance be um, that the households with children would show um, smaller probability of undergoing energy efficient retrofit we tried to explain it in terms of perhaps having children would reduce the disposable income that you could spend um, on energy efficient um, on energy efficient retrofits now to continue to the to the more interesting part, we have shown we have seen that several uh, social capital variables have shown to be um, have turned up to be significant, such as the ease of agreement, which is pretty straightforward, um, the helpfulness of the building manager, which speaks to the building's formal organization, um, the fact that there is no reserve fund affects um, probability of energy efficient retrofit in a negative way pretty straightforward. What we found interesting was that those respondents that um, claimed uh, that they attach importance to free of charge public energy counseling in the local community, which is available in Slovenia, um, also had the lower probability um, of undergoing energy efficient retrofits. Um, here we tried to explain this in terms of it's not enough just that you would have um, th that you would act in a council seeking type of way. Um, it is also required that you take some action uh, for the retrofit to actually happen. Um, it, here it also bears to mention that studies that my colleagues have, have previously performed um, have not found um, the information source of public energy counseling to be as important as, for instance, these information sources for which you would have to pay um, any kind of payable consultation, really. Uh, moving on to housing-related lifestyle, we have uh, shown that a small amount of time spent at home uh, would impact um, the probability of energy efficient retrofits in a negative way, which is uh, again, pretty straightforward, and we have found that certain dimensions of housing-related lifestyle, such as the DIY identity and exhibiting energy saving um, and environmentally friendly behavior, would increase the probability, while um, uh, strangely enough, spaciousness would decrease it. We tried to explain it in a way that perhaps if you attach more value to how large your home is, you would probably attach less importance to how energy efficient uh, it is. Um, we have also uh, we have also done marginal effects. Um, the thing that is um, um, that definitely leaves more room uh, for work is the fact that when we look at the marginal effects, we can see that the marginal effect of the importance attached to free of charge public energy counseling affects uh, the probability of energy efficient retrofit the most. This tells us that possibly there is a way there to expand the to expand the model to maybe uh, take it. In a different direction that would tell us um, this would give us more information on um, the factors that influence energy efficient uh, retrofits um, so as i said these are just the preliminary results that we interpreted in the following way uh, that certain individual and household characteristics significantly influence an individual's, individual's decision to perform energy efficient retrofits with age gender higher income education and taking out a loan would um, increase this probability. Having children in the household and being the first owner of the property would decrease it. We have also found the significant out, um, impact of dwelling and location characteristics. Namely, the older the building is, uh, the more likely uh, you are to renovate it. Also, the, whole, the, the size of the, um, of, of, the, of the space, the size of the respondent's home, and certain regional characteristics have shown to be significant, namely the region with the highest um, annual average temperature. Um, but this is the place where people would not be that much prone to energy efficient retrofits simply because they don't have the need uh, for that. Um, these empirical findings are pretty much in line with previous researchers research on this topic. Um, now, as we anticipated, there were several aspects of social capital and housing related lifestyle that turned out to play an important role in explaining um, household energy efficient retrofit behavior. Um, we have already mentioned, I've already mentioned the variables explaining the ease of agreement, the helpfulness of the building manager, as well as uh, the absence of a reserve fund 
the importance attached to free of charge public energy counseling in the local community. Uh, there have also been several housing related lifestyles dimension, dimensions that had a positive impact on retrofit decisions. Um, while, for instance, one of the housing related lifestyles dimensions and uh, the fact that the respondent spends a small amount of time at home would decrease that probability. Um, the conclusions that we have is that uh, including social capital and housing related lifestyle does turn out to be important. It can provide inputs for better targeted energy efficiency policies, as well as for policies fostering good practices when it comes to residence participation, pro-social norms, buildings formal organization. Um, what our further considerations are is to um, operationalize the housing related lifestyle instruments in terms of maybe considering additional dimensions or exploring the impact of these two concepts in conjunction with other concepts such as information sources which turned, which turned out to be significant here um, and uh, concepts such as energy literacy. Um, I would end my presentation here and open the floor for comments. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we have a few questions. I will uh, let first uh, Yi, maybe, if you want to ask her your question. Uh, in the chat, we have uh, for the weak effect of households with children. Mm -hmm. learning, how about taking considerations of family composition, that is to say, mm -hmm. age and our family? Um, this is a really, uh, this is a really good, uh, this is a really good question. This is the, these are information that we already have in the survey. Um, however, we have went, as you can expect, from through multiple iterations of the, uh, through multiple iterations of the model. Um, and uh, for instance, the the number of family members is not something that seemed to have a significant, uh, a significant impact. Um, however, I have I have heard about studies that um, gave a more more predominant, um, I'd say, role to, to age, uh, even gauging how many, for instance, um, senior citizens are in, in, the, in the household. Um, this is something that definitely can be done, and we will um, and, and we will think about it because the the because the information is available. Um, I see, Dorothée, that you have asked whether multiple retrofits for a same respondent are possible. Yes, they are. Uh, so we have left the option uh, for each respondent to select, uh, uh, to, to select as many retrofits as they have performed. Okay, because uh, if I ask this question, I think uh, there are some consequences about the type of setting that you use. No. For, for example, you use a logit model. I am not mm -hmm. sure that the decision uh, between one type of retrofit is independent for another type of retrofit. And it's possible sometimes mm -hmm. to use another type of setting, maybe a type of multivariate setting where decisions mm -hmm. are linked. Do you try this or? Uh, as, I, as I have said, these are only the preliminary results uh, okay, of yes, the study, yes, yes. so this is definitely uh, very helpful for me to receive constructive feedback in this way from your from your side. Uh, this is definitely something that is to be uh, uh, that is to be considered. So the way that we have currently modeled it is. If you have performed a certain type of retrofit here, uh, it was in a setting of a wider survey. So we asked um, about a different number of retrofits, which weren't even um, energy efficient retrofits at all. And if you have selected that you have performed any of those that I had listed, uh, then we would count as you have performed an energy efficient retrofit, uh, therefore the binomial setting. But I definitely think there is uh, definitely some meat uh, that could um, show that, for instance, a multinomial setting would be something that could uh, that, that could also work and possibly even work better. So I definitely thank you for that comment and, and your question. <laughs> and I have the last one. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, uh, does it exist some public policy for some type of retrofit or not? And this maybe can explain why uh, households decide to uh, stress on a specific type of retrofit instead of another one. I don't know about. Um... 
Uh, yes, so there are a large number of public policies, uh, public policies available uh, that would foster the energy efficient retrofits in Slovenia. However, one of the things that we're trying to show is that even though these these resources are available to people there still remains uh this the, the gap to be uh to be filled so there is a number of um a public policy set in place now probably one of uh, my, my mentors would uh would correct me if i had said if i said something wrong here uh however different studies uh in the same area have shown that simply having these policies and simply having uh, uh, the, this, this aid, especially the financial aid, is not, uh, is not in fact enough. Okay. No, no, it's true, but uh, uh, sometimes it can uh, explain also uh, the fact that some um, uh, retrofit are not completely independent for others because you are eligible for a type of policy yes. if you decide to uh, uh to invest in um roof insulation and in windows insulation and then only in, in only one so this is uh, the purpose of my question and thank you very much for your presentation and uh, the answers um thank you i will stop sharing the screen now yes uh, another we have time uh, if uh, someone has uh, i have uh, several questions if you don't mind Mm -hmm. uh, some uh, suggestions and some questions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, when uh, people present results from pro Probit or Logit, they usually present it in the form of marginal effect or odds ratio. So people can observe actually the size of the effect as well. For example, uh, not just whether the uh, probability is positive uh, or negative, but also by how much the probability is actually will increase if we observe a household with a higher education, like by 10%, by 15%, and etc. So this is just a small remark. Maybe uh, you have missed the slide where I actually uh -huh. gave the marginal effects. Ah, okay, areas. maybe so I missed it. Because potentially. You, I guess first you presented the coefficient, just the yes. Logic the coefficient. model, yeah, and, uh, yes. that's why probably and then the I marginal effect. Confused, yeah, I mm -hmm. apologize for that. Yeah. Okay. To continue. And, uh, secondly, uh, uh, cl clearly, is there are some potential problems with uh, endogeneity in your model because you don't have any experiment, any instrumental uh, variable. So uh, the things like uh, omitted uh, variable bias, uh, selection bias, and etc. can potentially some unobserved uh, characteristics of individuals can potentially bias your results. So uh, this is just also a small uh, remark. If you can come up with some instruments or some better strategy in the future, maybe you can implement second wave of the uh, survey. So at least you can potentially use fixed effects and then uh, control for time invariant unobserved characteristics as well but uh, this is just a remark uh, and the third is actually i uh, originally come from uzbekistan and i noticed that the most um, uh, popular retrofit in your data uh, was uh, windows uh, installations and it is the same in uzbekistan but there people change windows not mm -hmm. because they're more energy efficient, but simply because when they do any type of uh, reconstruction, they just want a new windows and they uh, usually change their old wooden windows for a new plastic one because they just look better. And the fact that they are more energy efficient is just a byproduct of them being a newer one. And uh, therefore, uh, maybe this can also potentially cause some problems in your results. So this were all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, so just to circle back to the to the third remark that you made, actually one of the categories was just simple window re replacement. The 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 other was window replacement, so that 
the windows are actually energy efficient. Uh, therefore, uh, it's, I don't, I understand your concern, but I don't mm -hmm. have the same concern given that mm -hmm. we have especially gauged uh, anticipating uh, this case that simply this is the easiest thing that people would replace uh, were they renovating a home. However, yeah, I can understand why this would be confusing. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you choose someone else? Okay, if we don't have any further question, uh, I let Mark sharing with us uh, his presentation. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, Can you see the slides? Perfectly. Perfect. Very nice. Yeah, thank you very much for having the opportunity to present today. Um, I got yesterday the vaccine, so uh, I was a bit yeah, distracted from the pre uh, preparation, but uh, I hope I can. And, and we are, uh, we have preliminary empirical results, so don't take this too serious. But I think I will focus a bit on the design. So. Uh, the discussion after the first talk was already interesting because, uh, yeah, we do a field experiment and um, avoid some of the um, something like uh, selection bias by uh, inducing an experiment. Of course, we can also discuss uh, limitations of, of an experiment at the end. Um, yeah, and um, today I start, so I only have a couple of slides, so I think we will be good in time. Um, yeah, uh, the background is that we, uh, it's part of a larger EU project and the, it's called New Clean Energy Communities in a Changing European Energy System. And the goal of the whole project is to deliver practical recommendations about how policymakers can support energy communities uh, to unfold their potential benefits for citizens and the energy union. And of course, the question is, what are benefits of uh, energy communities? And we, uh, in our work package and also in the study, we focus on energy conservation. So is it possible uh, that with energy communities that they can foster energy conservation and the demand response of the customers or households or members of the energy community. So in recent years, many different energy communities have emerged and there's a growing literature also, um, yeah, scientific academic literature and also gray literature on energy communities and how they differ and how um, what uh, different technical requirements are needed and so on. Um, regarding energy conservation, there's um, little evidence, I would say, so far, uh, if they can foster energy conservation. Um, there is, for example, the one study by Hoppet uh, that showed a, potent, a large potential for energy savings, but it is... Uh, yeah, uh, of course, every study has his, his her uh, limitations and um, a common uh, limitation, not only of this study, but also in other directions or areas, is that it's often not uh, based on actual energy consumption, but on self-reported or um, energy consumption or motivation to conserve energy, etc. And what we usually have is we have a selection bias. So if we uh, have already implemented an energy community, and as I said, there are very different energy communities. I don't want to give an overview about this, but uh, often they are also citizens led. So some citizens uh, work together and created an energy community. And if you then compare, for example, the energy consumption of these um, households and maybe all the members of the energy community compared to other customers in or other um, citizens of a country, then you have, of course, the problem that the households in that 
the self-selected into the energy community are highly motivated. And maybe it's not the energy community that induces the energy conservation, but uh, the underlying motivation that they are um, maybe also creating this energy community because they are uh, specifically environmentally concerned. So in our study, we had the chance to co-create an energy community uh, partnering with our Slovenian partner, Genai, who are also part of the larger EU consortium. <clears throat> and uh, we invited uh, customers of their uh, customer base to take part in a study. And uh, in the study, we did not mention energy communities, but just ask if they are interested to, to take part in a scientific study. More than 1,000 customers were willing to take part in the study. So we had a response rate of around 10%. And uh, we chose them based on some criteria. I don't want to get into details with this, but on some uh, criteria, we chose th around 300. Uh, and we call this the core study participants. So there is a difference. The others are still in the study. But we have less information about these other uh, customers and more information on the core study participants because we, um, yeah, our first, I, I continue here. So we, of these 300 core study participants, we had the chance to randomly assign customers into the new energy community. So we created an energy community. I will explain in a second what, uh, what the energy community was or is. And, but we could randomly assign them to the community. And this is uh, like a randomized control trial. It is a randomized control trial and allows the causal identification of the effect of the energy community on the electricity consumption behavior. In addition, we test whether additional behavioral interventions have a stronger effect for members of the energy community. So, Another idea is how energy communities could help to foster energy conservation is that not the energy con community in itself uh, creates an energy conservation effect, but if we have instruments, for example, behavioral interventions uh, that have an effect, maybe the members of the energy communities and the energy community in total uh, fosters this um, effect of these behavioral interventions. Uh, so what is the gen, uh, energy um, community? Uh, it's called Genai Energy Saving Community. So the joint goal of the community is to contribute to a more sustainable future by reducing daily energy use. And now what is below, what is bold is only, part, only for, the, for the household that were randomly assigned to the energy community. And the other is also uh, available for all other um, core study participants. So the difference between the community and the others is what it what is in bold. So all households of this uh, core study um, participants uh, get access to an online platform displaying uh, for um, their real time electricity use data. Uh, there were water and energy use data registered by smart shower heads, so um, their water consumption in the shower. And the energy community also got information about the electricity water consumption of the entire community and a virtual map showing location of all community members. Uh, in addition, they had the chance to, um, to discuss uh, topics, energy related, but in general, everything they wanted to, to discuss. So there was an interactive discussion forum. Uh, we also, uh, from time to time, um, added some best practices and experience um, or, or best practices or energy saving tips, or this was for everyone, um, but they could exchange or have exchanged their best practices and experience with the energy community. And they had the chance, at least potentially, to, to meet virtually. And then we had newsletters with energy saving tips and snapshots of the data. So what is important, what we tried with this design is to disentangle um, 
the information uh, effects from the energy community effects. So we try to have a design that explicitly is uh, able to identify the effect of the energy community. And this is also what, what I would like to discuss even a bit more is, okay, what, what was the idea to create this energy saving community? Our main research question, as I said, is can we foster with this energy com com community energy conservation and de demand response? What would be the mechanism, how this would could induce uh, energy conservation? The idea would be that we create group identity of these customers and create a joint goal of energy conservation. So what is uh, special in regard to at least many other energy communities so that there is no technical requirement such as investments in renewable energy power plants and so on. Then it is introduced by the energy supplier. As we said, it's from energy, from Genai created. So from the Slovenian energy supplier, not by a self-selected group of um, customers or, or citizens. And, and therefore there is no self-selection. So we have a specific uh, energy community. Uh, what is good? Um, is that there's um, the potential or uh, yeah, it's, it's even, it's designed to identify the causal effect of the energy community. And what is also nice is that potentially this could be large scale easily because this energy community could basically be implemented by every energy supplier in the EU. So of course, these good points have also bad. Uh, or limitations. So we don't say that our results are true for every energy community in the EU. So our energy community is uh, different to others. And this is uh, in, in general what we found in the whole project that energy communities vary a lot. And so it's not so easy to, to, to state the overall effect on, on energy conservation. So, <clears throat> but this is generally, we have to be more careful if something is context dependent or not. So what was the research plan? So uh, in, in June 2022, we contact, uh, contacted the households and get concept and collected survey data. So we have a survey also at the beginning and the end of, of the study. Then we selected the household and installed shower heads. So the smart shower heads that allow to observe the water consumption in the shower. Then we have a baseline data and in this period of time, there was no difference between the groups. And then we created at the beginning of December, the uh, energy community that meant that um, all households could uh, go to the virtual platform and the community members could see also the elements of the energy community. And then we have another baseline data before we implement uh, the behavioral intervention. And this behavioral intervention is a feedback treatment of the shower. I can show you uh, later uh, what that is exactly. So the, the shower heads that were implemented there uh, for the households had the option that uh, the lights could switch on. So the shower head has lights in different colors. And uh, if you shower more or longer, um, depending on the liters and our um, benchmarks or, or settings, and then after 10 liters, it switched from blue to from green to blue and, and so on and so forth. And in the end, it, uh, it has a red light and at some uh, specific um, amount of liters, it starts to blink red. Okay, and then after it, an, another month at the beginning of April, we implemented a demand response treatment. I will not discuss this uh, today because we also don't have the empirical results for the feedback treatment. So this is just to understand the design. So this is for future presentations. And in the end, so now we have collected the data and um, yeah, we, we already, or since a longer time we work with the data, but it's not so easy. Okay, here's the data and the, and the uh, it's called balancing normally uh, in the experiment. So we uh, 
a check between the control and the treatment group. And here control and treatment is, is meant the energy community. So we have this behavioral intervention and so on, but we don't discuss this uh, here. So it's the control and treatment between the energy community and the others. And we see here that the balancing worked um, well, so we don't see a significant difference between uh, the different um, yeah, variables that we, that we can observe based on the survey. And you see that we have a, a couple of information. So we have the general or the normal socioeconomic characteristics, and then we have data on electric equipment and the attitudes like environmental concern. <laughs> so what was the treatment? Um, there is the portal went online at December 2020 and all the households get, for example, this electricity tab where they can see their electricity consumption in the past and uh, almost uh, live and uh, compare it um, with their past history and so on. And then we have a community dashboard that allows communication and also shows for example, the electricity consumption of the whole community. And the goal is, um, the general goal of the community is to serve, um, to save energy. Yeah, and we hoped that we can motivate the households, the members of the energy community to save energy. Uh, that are our first results, but it's really preliminary, but it looked so that we don't find an energy conservation effect. So what uh, we show here, it's a, it's a regression, but it's reduced on the um, coefficient that is of main interest. So we have individual fixed effects and day fixed effects to control for the time and uh, for individuals um, effects. Um, and the dependent variable is electricity consumption of household I on day T compared to the baseline period before uh, the community dashboard was activated. There are also we will do some buses check, of course, you can also normalize this differently. But what you see here is the percentage change and the post treatment just means that electricity consumption uh, increased. Um, but this is also explicable by the fact that uh, the treatment period was more in the winter months. And, but we don't see an interaction effect of the treatment of the post dummy. So, and this point estimate is even positive, so it's not significant, so we should not over interpret this, but it would, uh, the point estimate even points in, in the uh, wrong direction, so that a positive effect would mean that um, the members of the energy community um, used more energy than the non energy community members. Yeah, these are first results, but it looks like also when you look at the descriptive results, it's lo it looks like that at least there's no large effect um, in the, uh, induced. And then we will do some heterogeneous uh, heterogeneity uh, analysis. And uh, again, we see here that uh, the post uh, dummy is, um, is significant, but that again, only means that during the treatment period, it was consumed more electricity, but we don't find any, so far, any, uh, any heterogeneous effects. Um, <laughs> we also have a pre-analysis plan and we defined there also other effects on the, for example, we want to test if the energy community induced a group identity um, effect. And this is based on the second survey that is currently uh, undergoing. So we have other outcomes that we want to have a look at because it's of course interesting to see if the energy community um, was able to induce a group identity or not. If not, this would of course be also um, a potential reason why this, uh, why we don't find, likely don't find an energy conservation effect. And then we can conclude that there's an ongoing decentralization in the electricity sector. We study the impact of an energy community and energy conservation. We have, I guess, a unique option that we randomly assigned households to the energy community and so avoid, avoid self-selection bias. 
and also other problems. And also I see, again, as I said, this energy community would be, if it would have been or would be effective, that would be very nice because it would be easy to implement it uh, for other utilities, but uh, it doesn't seem so. So our very preliminary results, uh, we find no evidence for energy conservation. And this might indicate that it is challenging to induce energy conservation through group identity. Thank you very much. If you're interested, I could show you a couple of slides on, on the platform to get a better impression. But I'm also, of course, very happy to, to answer every question that there is. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. I, I think we have a question of Salim. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, I, I just asked in the chart, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just asked in the chat if uh, the consumers uh, had an option to opt out of this program. Um, it was not directly stated. I, I'm, I have to check with the with the Jenna, mm -hmm. and they they of course had the chance if they complained. But I guess nobody did it, and uh, I'm not sure how explicitly it was stated in the in the mm -hmm. letter. Mm -hmm. That I'm not sure. So um, I mean, yeah, I'm... you have to give mm -hmm. them the option to also to. Yeah, to sure. Offer. That's why I asked. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm just asking this because there still might be some selection bias in your results, right? Because if the consumers are able to opt out of the programs, then only the more environmentally conscious people will choose to participate in this program. And I guess this is uh, what we can see in, uh, in slide eight. If you go to slide eight, there is a variable which shows the uh, uh, environmental consciousness, yeah? And you see that the, actually the t statistics is statistically significant there. It's one, almost one point seven which is like 95 percent statistically uh, significant as far as i remember no, so uh, 1.96 it's 10 uh, percent uh, it's 10 percent yeah yeah so so yeah. i just uh you mean that only the checking for this will look nice yeah so you mean that just to understand your concern it's mm -hmm. uh, that only the environmental concern customers are taking uh, part in the study or that in the treatment group are only the environmentally concerned? Yeah, it uh, might be the case that uh, those people uh, who actually say yes to this program, if they're able to opt out, of course, are uh, actually uh, taking part in this experiment and by nature, there are more environmentally concerns than compared to to those who choose to opt out of the program. Mm -hmm. But this is uh, only if they're actually able to, to yeah. do so, like, which, yeah. I, I, I completely agree that this would be a problem. I, I, I think it's easily, we can easily check this, but I think there was not much opting out. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we will ask mm -hmm. the energy utility. Of course, if there are, Mm, yeah, if if this if this sample is representative for the uh, customers of the utility or in general for European uh, customers, this is of course difficult because uh, yeah, maybe we have a selection into the study, but this should not have an effect on the on the on the causal identification of the energy community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This. Okay. Yeah, and of course we are. Uh, we need informed consent for the studies. Yeah, uh, and yeah. just uh, oh, one more advice, maybe uh, you did not find any statistically significant uh, result. Did you try to run the regression by different groups of households, by different 
quantiles of income, education, household size, and etc. Maybe there you will find the effect. Maybe you will find effect for the households with a lower income or the higher income and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just- yeah. I mean, we but, always have to be careful with this because of course, when you test a lot, um, sure. you always find uh, stars somewhere. But uh, we are at the start with this uh, analysis. Uh, what is um, very obvious to test for uh, the interaction with the baseline consumption, electricity consumption. A couple of studies in other direction, also my own, have shown that there's often an, an interaction effect that it's also logical that the people that conserve, uh, that uh, consume the most in the baseline have the larger potential to save energy. And so the um, effect could be greater for them. So to have a difference between, for example, median uh, customers that are below the median of the baseline energy consumption and, and the ones that mm -hmm. are higher. And so on that, that we will definitely do. Um, yeah, uh, but if we test a lot and find stars, we also have to uh, check for multiple hypothesis testing. Yeah, yeah, sure. uh, we, uh, we will do this, but uh, to, just to see, explore if there's something and we'll explicitly state this. And uh, as I also mentioned, we, we try to also see if with the second survey, if we find any difference between control and treatment in, in something like group identity or willingness to conserve energy and so on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, thank you very much. Um, anyone? else uh, yes yes hello perhaps my question uh, have you checked so far how how active people were within the community did they really create this identity of community uh, and perhaps have you checked also how many times or the frequency that they control their consumption and uh, so on yes <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I did not have this properly so that I could show this in this in this presentation, uh, regression or something like this. We don't have the results of the second survey, so we have there implemented some um, elicitations from the psychological literature, how to ask for group identity. But what I can say that the activity on the platform was lower than we expected. And we tried to increase this during the, the study period, but it was still low. So this could be, of course, an, a good reason is that we could not uh, activate the people to, to communicate really a lot. And the question then arises, of course, why not? And this is also something that we try to um, elicit with the second survey, why they're not used more. I, I was a bit, or, or most of us were a bit surprised because we, these are at least people that wanted to take part in a, in a study and had now the unique possibility of this portal and the, the um, and, and I think the portal was nicely created and so from, from the partners, so it looks good. So, and also technically it was easily possible. Um, so yeah, that could be that it was not enough, but the question then arises, uh, okay, what, what was, is it not possible to motivate people to, to communicate with, um, yeah, foreign customers or other customers that they don't know so good. Um, or is this somehow specific or did we miss something that was, uh, could have increased the communication? That are good points, but uh, we tried, we will try to answer these. Um, to, to, yeah, hopefully. But coming from Slovenia, I would say that, um, well, national identity is such that if you don't know the people, it's hard to break the ice, you know, to start communication. So 
maybe this could explain low communications and actually this is what I expected. That's why I asked this question. That's interesting. So I think it's not unusual what you found um, given the, I, I would say national identity or culture. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, the Slovenian partners also, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if they, yeah. I think they also expected more communication, but they also mentioned that the Slovenians, yeah, maybe it's also a cultural context that would mean that, for example, in Germany, maybe it would work better, but uh, I doubt this, but um, I don't know. I mean, there are... Uh, or they were too much concerned about the pandemic, not so much about... Uh, conserving uh, electricity <laughs> yeah this is of course also a problem that we probably all have that are doing at least experiments during the pandemic um, but yeah but at least during uh, as long as the results were not there uh, there were different hypotheses in which direction this leads some said that the most people have more time to focus on their electricity consumption and I think there are first studies that show that um, during the pandemic more people conserved energy but yeah uh, the study will not answer all this question because of course it's only one study and yeah to to try to to identify if there's uh, cultural uh, reasons why this the communication was not so high yeah we would need more studies in different uh, countries but we will try our, our best to to at least um, uh, describe indications uh, what could be the reasons yeah thank, thank you, you very much. yeah okay shall i stop uh, sharing yes and um, maybe salim if you uh... If you want to share with us your presentation. Yeah, sure. Let me uh, just share the, share the screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, perfect. Uh, let me... Uh, view, I guess, yes, in this. Uh, so uh, everything is fine, right? So I can start my presentation. Okay, so um, good time uh, of the day, everybody. My name is Salim Turdaliev. I am a PhD student at Institute of Economic Studies, Charles University in Prague. And today I'm going to present you my research uh, regarding the increased block rate electricity pricing and propensity to purchase electric appliances, evidence from a natural experiment in Russia. Uh, so uh, this research provides empirical evidence on the relationship between increasing block rate pricing of electricity and the propensity of households to purchase major electric appliances. So I exploit a um, natural experiment in Russia uh, to solve the identification problem uh, so this, so Russia introduced the increasing broad rate tariffs in 2013 in a number of uh, experimental regions, uh, more exactly seven. So I just use a um, standard uh, difference in difference approach to calculate the effect of this uh, IBR pricing on the propensity of people to purchase major electric appliances. So according to my estimations, uh, the propensity in the experimental regions went up by 25% uh, or more exactly two percentage points uh, if we compare uh, to the non-experimental regions. So first of all, we should take some time in order to discuss the increasing block rate structure in Russia. So in Russia, 
unlike in majority of um, other countries, the um, IBR is based on so-called social norms. And the social norms are calculated on the basis of uh, household characteristics. So actually different types of households have their own prescribed cutoffs or social norms. So if the household consumes below this cutoff or prescribed uh, social norm, they pay in the lower price. If they if their consumption of electricity exceeds this cutoff, uh, then they start to pay at an increased higher price. So this experiment was introduced in 2013 in the seven uh, regions of Russia. So there are about 38 um, regions total in Russia. And in our data set, we have access to the three out of seven experimental regions and more than 35 um, control regions. Uh, so as I said, uh, these cutoffs are actually dwelling specific. So here I am presenting some calculations uh, how actually the cutoffs are calculated for each type of the household. So first of all, we see that uh, they are uh, sensitive to the number of people that reside in the households. So they also differ for urban and uh, rural households, um, households on social benefits, uh, whether the household uses an electric oven and etc. And we also see that the actually cutoffs, the calculations of this cutoffs is actually also different in these uh, three experimental regions as well. So we have lots of variations, both, on, both in tariff and the cutoffs as well. So this is just a graphical representation uh, of this table. So I took a yeah, maximum of eight people in our data set. Data set actually the maximum number of people was 16, as far as I remember. So we see that the prescribed social norm actually is increasing with the number of people. Uh, so this is just a graphical representations of the actual tariff in Russia. So, so this is in nominal rubles, the national uh, Russian currency. So we see that they have four main tariffs. Uh, so we see that uh, before 2013, we observed only two, which is a, a flat type of tariff. So it only differed uh, for the households with an installed electric stove and for ordinary type of households. And starting from 2013, actually we also see that uh, we can observe two more additional tariffs, uh, which are by the definition as a second block of consumption or the tariffs that you would pay if you uh, consume more than your prescribed social norm. So just so you don't get uh, lost. So my last uh, observations are in 2019 and in 2000. 19, the exchange rate of um, ruble for dollar was one to 70. So one uh, US dollar is actually equal to about 70, uh, 70 Russian rubles. So this is as a tariff for Krasnoyarsk. Uh, this is a tariff for Rostov. And this is a tariff for Nizhny Novgorod. So those are the three experimental regions which we observe in our data. And this is just the average tariff for the remaining 30 plus control regions in our data set. So 
uh, I'm using a panel data, which is a Russian longitudinal monitoring survey conducted by the Higher School of Economics. So the survey started in 1994. So it is, uh, it was, developed and is uh, supported by the Carolina Population Center in USA. So each year they um, survey about 7,000 households uh, with about 18,000 individuals. So the sample that I'm using is for 10 years from 2010 and ending with 2019, which is the last year of the survey so far. And uh, I'm not using any data prior to 2010 because I'm trying to avoid uh, the effect of the great uh, uh, financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. So those are the characteristics of the dwellings. So we see that the characteristics in control and treatment regions are mainly identical. The only major difference uh, is actually lying in the level of uh, urbanization um, of two households. So in the control regions, the level of urbanization is actually uh, more than 74%, while in treatment uh, regions, it's 94%. And this in turn is reflected in the difference in other uh, two variables as well, uh, which are uh, whether they have any installed electric stove or whether they have a central delivery of the gas. So uh, this has a household socioeconomics. Again, we see that the um, characteristics are fairly identical uh, across both regions. Uh, we also see that the fairly large share of households are actually receiving some type of benefits and, and uh, subsidies for the um, utilities, if to be precise. Uh, 28% in control region and 27% in treatment region are actually receiving cash transfers for the utilities from the government. Uh, and um, other 18 and 19% are actually um, receiving subsidies, which are a form of discounts in Russia for the household utilities. So since we are concerned with the home appliances, I also present some um, uh, summary statistics for the appliances in both types of regions. So we see that here we observe some differences in the number of uh, freezers. So in treatment, uh, regions, 22% of people reported that they have a freezer separate from the refrigerator, uh, while in the control region, this um, indicator is close to 14%. So what is my main dependent variable or an indicator for the purchase of the appliance? So the, my main indicator is uh, defined by this question, which is ask the respondents uh, whether they have purchased any energy intensive appliance in the last three months, uh, which is actually prior to the interview, of course. And this I use as a, my main dependent variable in my model. Uh, so here's the actual econometric model that I use, which is a difference in difference. Uh, so uh, my, my dependent variable is an indicator for the purchase of 
appliance or energy intensive appliance. Uh, I also include the price of the electricity in my model, any benefits in rubles which are received by the households. I also include some time varying uh, observed characteristics like uh, household income, household size. So uh, these two stands for the household and time fixed effect to be more precise, a year fixed effect. And the last but not least is my interaction term, which is actually my main uh, variable of interest, which actually gives us this estimate of the difference in difference model. Uh, so usually in this type of studies, we need to uh, graph the dependent variable across time in both treatment and control regions. So by this, we can check for the uh, parallel trend assumption. So here we see that we indeed observe some parallel trend in here. So the treatment was introduced in 2013. And as we expect, the, we observe the change in the behavior of the people with some time lag, of course. So, and we see this, uh, the, this effect of the IBR started to kick in in about 2015, uh, when the propensity to purchase electric, um, major electric appliances went up, actually. So now, as I said here, we observe some effect, uh, right? But one may easily argue that uh, this effect was not due to the introduction of IBR, but, but some other effect may be observed, um, uh, may be unobserved, right? So we should check for the so-called placebo effect. So for this, I use another type of um, purchase indicator, which is available in the in our data set. And this exact indicator asks people if they, if in the last three months, they have purchased any uh, so-called recreational appliances like uh, TV, tape recorder, uh, video recorder, uh, musical instruments, computer, camera and the like. So ideally, we should not observe any increase in the purchase of this type of variables as they're not energy intensive and it wouldn't make any sense for people to buy these appliances due to introduction of increased block rate tariffs. And this is indeed what we see in our data. We see that there is no uh, any type of change after the introduction of the um, treatment in 2013. We can just observe a sharp dip uh, of purchase of appliances in 2015, which we can also partially observe here uh, for the control regions. And I explained this by the fact that in 2015, the Russia started to feel the effect of the sanctions uh, that were employed uh, due to the conflict in Crimea. Uh, and uh, due to this, Russian ruble has actually devalued uh, by 100% uh, towards the um, uh, United States dollar. And in Russia, the majority of the appliances are actually imported. And this, of course, uh, resulted in the higher price of these appliances in Russia. So therefore, we, we can observe uh, this sharp decrease in the purchase of the recreational 
appliances in 2015. So before um, we move to the main results, I also run some unconditional difference in difference estimate without uh, controlling for any uh, fixed effect or other covariates. So we see that the, uh, the unconditional estimates for the propensity to purchase major electric appliances is actually a, a highly statistically significant and positive. Uh, while the, uh, the same estimates for the purchase of recreational appliances is statistically insignificant and the coefficient is also very small in size. Uh, before I show you the final result, we should address some possible uh, endogeneity concerns. So usually when we deal with in increasing block rate tariff, the prices that we observe are actually endogenous because they are, they are a direct function of your uh, electricity consumption. So this happens usually when the studies try to estimate the elasticity of price and income elasticities uh, of the uh, electricity and when is your and when your dependent variable is actually electricity consumption in our case my dependent variable is not electricity consumption so the concerns for the indigenous are minimal however in order to address any other concerns related to the indigeneity of the price I also run the two-stage least squares where I instrument for the price with a full tariff schedule. So this, this is the usual approach in energy literature, which are trying to estimate the elasticity of price or income. So uh, those are my results. I don't show you the year fixed effects because uh, I, I don't have enough space here. Uh, but we can see that the, the effect of the introduction of IBR, which is given by this interaction term, uh, are actually statistically significant at 10%, uh, while they were significant at 5% in the unconditional estimates, but this is not surprising because here uh, uh, along uh, with uh, other control variables, we're also uh, using the time and uh, households a fixed effect, which uh, it up lots of variation. And therefore, it is not surprising uh, that we, uh, we have a reduction in the statistical significance. But Anyway, the results are significant at 10%. You can also observe the, that the income is also statistically significant in both uh, uh, fixed effect uh, estimations and in two-stage list specification. And uh, the last statistically significant estimate is the effect of the subsidies uh, so we see that the households which receive subsidies are more probable to purchase uh, a, a major electric appliances. However, the effect is uh, not significant economically. The effect is very small. Uh, but the effect of the interaction term actually indicates that the households in the treatment regions are more than two percentage points uh, higher in purchasing the major electric appliances, which is about 25% increase compared to the control regions. Uh, so in conclusion, I would like to say that even though I do not observe any energy efficiency indicators for the 
for the actual appliances that are being bought, uh, taking into account the uh, robust trends of the uh, newer appliances becoming more energy efficient, we can state uh, that people buying uh, new appliances may be also buying a more efficient appliances and uh, which is considered uh, to be one of the lowest cost, uh, cost opportunities for reducing carbon emissions. So potentially in this study, I show that the price-based energy policies can be an effective tool in shaping the behavior of the households towards a more energy efficient behavior. So uh, this was all. Uh, thank you for your attention. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Okay, maybe maybe me. Uh, I can begin. Just uh, just to have um, uh, um, uh, um, a picture of uh, of a residential sector. A um, electricity is the main fuel, or uh, the share of electricity. What is the share of electricity? Maybe you said it at the beginning of the presentation, but. Uh... Uh, so uh, here, by saying uh, electricity, I just. Uh uh saying the actual uh electricity tariffs right so i guess you are asking if people are using electricity for such things as a uh, home heating uh, like uh, water heating and uh, etc mm -hmm. uh, right so in russia actually many households still uh, are connected to the central heating system okay so the heat in winter is actually delivered by the state and it is quite cheap so they just have a, a huge uh, water boiling plants all right and then they just send hot water along the pipes to the household so the majority of the households don't use electricity neither for heating nor for uh water okay. heating at, uh, at home and, okay and uh about the price so you introduce in your estimates the price of uh, electricity i'm just wondering if it's possible to have a type of relative price uh, compared to other type of energy or i don't know uh i uh -huh. i'm not sure it's relevant in a mm -hmm. russian context mm -hmm. but I, I, I'm, I'm surprised that the price elasticity is not significant. Uh, yes, so, so uh, here I'm not uh, actually estimating the price elasticity because my dependent variable is not electricity consumption. Uh, but in other study of mine, which I'm uh, conducting uh, jointly with uh, my supervisor, uh, actually we are estimating the uh, price and income elasticities for the same data set. And there we find that the elasticity is uh, about 0 0.10. Yes. And it is statistically uh, significant at 95%. So here, uh, the fact that the price is not significant determinant of the purchase of the electric uh, appliance is not surprising because um, in other studies as well, people actually found uh, that the price itself is actually not a statistically significant indicator. They found some um, statistical significant uh, results for the actual structure of the price, which I also find is, um, here. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? No. Okay. 
So I think uh, uh, we, we we have finished. Thank you very much. Let me uh, stop sharing. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, finished this session. So uh, I want to thank you, uh, each participant, for your presentation and, uh, and uh, nice conference. And uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much to Dorothy. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.